Hello, Bill. Hello, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. I didn't ask how you were last time and you waited for it. I did. So I had to make sure I got that in there. <laughs> no, as usual, I haven't asked how you are. Terrible. Absolutely <laughs> awful. So what are we discussing today? Well, last week you said we should talk about identity. Okay. And so I thought I could put together a whole host of portraits from across a wide span of art history. And then I kind of got sidelined in doing something else. So I was thinking about basically romantic painting and what the notions are surrounding romance. And in that process, I uh, was looking at work by Freud and also by um, Celia Paul. We'll come he, to that. He was in a, a painter too? Lucien Freud. Oh, okay. Sigmund <laughs> yeah. was the grandfather. Oh, I didn't know that actually. Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, we're going to come to those particular artists in context of um, identity crisis. Um, mm. And I just wonder, identity crisis, in terms of a meaning, what is an identity crisis? Is that something where we're unsure of who we are? Um, what does it mean to you, identity crisis? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a breakdown of ego kind of going on, right? I think that there is a base level foundation of how we see ourselves that informs how we interact with the world, how we take in information, how we process it. And I think sometimes when you start questioning, <laughs> it's funny, uh, sometimes I feel like our show, the questions you bring up on our show cause me to have an identity crisis. Um, you know, this sort of the, you know, what, what does I mean kind of mm -hmm. things. Uh, all those so things reason, you hate talking about. The things that drive me crazy mm -hmm. drive me crazy because until we figure that out, nothing else can be figured out. So we need to sort of just decide on a definition of those things and move forward. Um, but I think that with, with our own selves, I think that there's lots of situations where, you know, where we get lost in questioning who we are and that just creates this inability to move forward with our lives. I don't know. Frame one. Bill is a young man. No. <laughs> David Hawk, how is he still alive? He smokes like a chimney, this man. He's got a cigarette in his hand in paintings. He doesn't even like, it's not just in real life. How has he not gotten lung cancer yet? Do you like David Hockney? Sometimes. I do like this painting. Does he live near you? No. Where does he live? Do you know? Um, well, I mean, he spends a lot of time in the States, doesn't he? Oh, does he? Okay. Mm. I can't remember if it's back up or somewhere. It's somewhere, not, it's not near the South. But the reason why I put this here for identity crisis is this to me is the antithesis of an identity crisis. This is an artist who is well established, well known, respected, revered, loved, a national treasure, so on and so on. And here he is in his tweed suit with his yellow ties, flat cap, his amazing spectacles, his cigarette painting. So he's painted himself in the action that constructs the reality or the identity that we, we know of him. So it's a kind of, um, it's a very conclusive painting and as a portrait, self-portrait, it um, embodies the identification of Hockney as the symbol, I think. Can I take the devil's advocate angle on this painting? Yep. Maybe everything you said is true, in the sense that this is what he thinks that people think that he is. And he painted that and it's all actually just a big ruse and he's just putting on a face of what it is, yeah. But nonetheless, I think this is the way that most people see David Hockney. I, I agree with that half of right? it. I wonder if this is how he sees himself. 
Well, I mean, that's something that we can't maybe know. I mean, yes, we can delve around and we can watch footage of him and we can see interviews that he's given. We can read about him and his life. How much can we ever really know another person? I mean, even amongst very close relationships, how often do we really know another human? Do you uh, think you know yourself even? Uh, what's happened to me in the last few years, or is me in the last few years, is I have come to realize more what I am. It's been, it's been very uh, um, disturbing in one way to uh, come to come to terms with who one is, is a very stupid way to put it because it implies there's something ugly or awful in it. But I've been going through a process of puncturing, popping the bubbles, or I guess another way would be shattering an illusion that I may have had about myself. Um, and that's why when I look at this painting, you know, just as a symbol, Hockney has done the job of painting his own sy sy uh, symbol very effectively. Yes. And I really wonder though, if, 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 if he feels this way, that's, that would be my big question. I, I, it's funny. You're saying that you, you, as you've gotten older the last few years, you think you've come into understanding yourself more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cause it's interesting. Cause like lately I've become to, I've come to question myself. Like I was much more sure of myself when I was younger. Doesn't mean I'm not questioning though. Yeah, but you're going in, you're trending in one direction and I'm trending in the other direction. You're, you're getting, you're being put together and I'm falling apart. I don't see why we always have to be so polarized, nor do I see why we have to be compartmentalized. I don't see why we need to be positioned without the new... No without the nuance of what it really means to know oneself you can say you're falling apart and i'm putting myself together that's fine but that's far too simplistic for what is happening okay do you think that one can even know maybe the 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 the, the public's view of david hockney is more of an icon of david hockney than even the real david hockney in his own brain is yes so this is the fascinating thing about people who paint or make work as portraits. Yep. I mean, you make portraits. Occasionally. Hmm. And in that portrait making, what do you distill about your sitter? Are you actually just distilling your relationship to that sitter in the moment at which you make the photograph. I mean, we've talked about very similar things. I, yeah, I, I think that that is all te technically and, and that is always true. This is this is Sandy or in the moment. This is David Hockney in the moment. This is Right, but there's David another, David. there is something else in this, of course, where one is making work about oneself. Sure. I, I, I think that my portraits, um, have less about me in them than a lot of other people's portraits do. Mm. Um, just because I don't really have a lot of good ideas, so I rely on the other person's as the subject to to bring everything. But uh, I don't know. It's it's a I try to wear people down. <laughs> do you do you sometimes wonder if if the the that a person's own mind gets in their way of their own identity. Them thinking about their identity is actually obfuscating their identity. Their identity is what they get when they're not thinking about it. I think all identity is illusion, Bill. Yeah, well, everything's illusion, right? No, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I mean, at a certain point, sure. But like, yeah, sure, it is. I think that there, but I think there are some people who wanted to be more illusory than others some people are putting on more of a show than other people are would you agree with that 
or do you think everyone's equally putting on a show? I just don't think in, in such terms, Bill. Yeah. Really. Um, I have no I mean, idea just, if people's amount of self is equal or different. What interests me is that the self is constructed through process of relationship to illusion and ideas that are all dead. They're all gone. Yeah. And when we create symbols and when we work with symbols and use symbols, which we do as artists, we're working with dead things. And that's really freaky for a lot of people to, to acknowledge. Um, and there are many different levels to that statement. I could say that, um, you know, there's a kind of time-based element to making anything that becomes fixed then in time moving forward, which crystallizes it, suspends it, so on. That's very obvious. But there's also the sense that the underpinning philosophy, context, spirit, of what is there in the work might be alive and vital in the participator, either as viewer or artist or perhaps even sitter. But nonetheless, we are working with ideas. And as soon as we have an idea, we're in the past. Yeah. So everything we have as a symbol is a dead thing. And even though we think our symbols live for us, breathe vitality into our languages, and our understanding, their communications with each other. I think we could all probably eventually come to terms with the record, the symbol, the word, not actually being the thing at all. It is just the record, the symbol or the word. Sure, it's the representation of it, not the actual thing, sure. I know, but to make it so succinct is also diminishing it rather, Bill, but um, with this, this painting, I like this painting because it's kind of like having a jar that says strawberry jam and then inside is strawberry jam. Yeah, it does what it says on the tin. Fine. Whereas in other portraits, other work by other people, because of other things that we may know about them, mm -hmm. the narrative spillage of their lives, and what we know about them, creates a, a whole different kind of mythology this painting to me doesn't have a myth or a mythology even though it creates or further enhances a sense of yeah. legend right it, it, it is a yeah this is this is fully a myth or a mythology even though it looks superficially like it's not but it doesn't have to me the same kind of romance that the other myths do when we're looking at paintings that perhaps carry a weightedness of um, mystery. That doesn't yeah, mean that Hockney's not actually just selling as a pack of lies about himself, but there is a very clear alignment between persona that's been projected over many decades true. and then what we then find in this painting. And I think, I mean, I think that's also true of Hockney's work in general. It's not, I don't mean to say it's superficial as in it's not deep, but it is it's not dark. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's sort of, it often is what it says on the tin, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the kids at the bottom of this frame freak me out. Yes, everything about this freaks me out. I mean, I, I, I like him. I don't like the kids. The kids feel weirdly pasted on in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Because they're in a different plane. They're isolated. They're outside of him. I mean, I would say that this is a meditation on parenthood. No, his well, maybe his position in life. Oh. Of course. I mean, very often we're seeing self-portraits and painting, obviously, that have been worked on through the portal of the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that that's how the artist sees themselves in order to see what then manifests on the surface of the canvas. But reflection with two children, self-portrait, is a very, um, I think, disturbing painting. Uh, it is a fascinating uh, angle from 
which to paint it issues in one way a set of conventions in portraiture yet it also embraces the idea that the portrait sitter is elevated and superior um it makes that oh see interesting i i would have looked at it the exact opposite way because in his position he's looking down at himself mm. we are seeing him looking up but he's looking down and seeing an image of himself mm. it's also the way he's hold his left hand it's weird but it's that very very movement, so this this is a very dynamic painting because i think anyone who's turned to make the mark i can imagine the movement the life of this the life of this artist in this moment with himself now oh you think he's turning to his left looking in the mirror turning to his right and the painting is over there somewhere yeah and in some ways i don't think that's important what i think is important is that we as the viewer are confronted by the superior self Do you think that there's also something to just his being distorted? Like that's like, like it, there's a grotesqueness to this too. Well, his painting to me is quite grotesque. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, even in a choice of a self portrait, doing it that way is an interesting option, uh, interesting choice. Well, well, he's not, on. he's not molly coddled ever or shied away from the grotesque. I'm sorry, what does molly coddled mean? I don't know that word. Like, um, you know, made everything okay. Oh, okay. Made it benign or simple. Yep. You know, he's always given us very difficult flesh, for example. Yeah. The way the, the flesh is painted by Freud is lumpy and sometimes quite jaundiced seeming and sickly fetid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the colors, his, his paintings are not, uh, they're not uh, flattering of people no i mean it doesn't mean they're not extraordinarily beautiful as paintings no uh, but if you had the same image as a photograph people would say oh that's not a great it's interesting the things you can do with paint yes they're also caricaturesque the way he structures facial features and things yes but in context of our title identity yeah. crisis yeah i wonder if this painting is crisis I wonder if there's a story in the painting where, you know, in 1965, how old would he have been? Maybe. Oh, when was he born? 14? I don't know. Okay. Um, He's like our age. You know, is this a man at almost like a peak of power? looking down on the world and again positionally thinking about the, the two children you know those two children are ghastly yeah um why are they there in that way why are they so small when he is so large you know it, it plays with our why sense are they there at all yeah. well it plays with our sense of perspective in that i can imagine for example the children running into the studio and being ushered back out again but their presence being there would be visibly uh, larger to us if we are to imagine that we're looking at the surface of the mirror. Yes? Yeah, sure, yeah, I'm listening. So on all levels, I find this very disturbing. And so for this, the identity crisis is actually in me. Um, because do I relate to this painting at all? I don't want to. I don't want to relate to this painting. Uh, there's also, see, it's interesting because you see it as him feeling powerful. I, I get a sense that he feels sad. I see a predator. See, that's interesting. I see someone falling apart. That doesn't mean he's not a predator, Bill. True. It doesn't mean that he is. Mm. Um, 
it's just it's interesting to me that you you see it as you're putting yourself in the position of the mirror of of the viewer of the painting yes and Where I, i'm looking at it as if if you zoomed out you would see the mirror on the floor not that we're looking up at him but that he's looking down at the mirror looking down on himself yeah I don't know why my titles have gone all over the place today. I'm really sorry. And um, okay. So this to me has a has a different feeling altogether. There's I mean I do I do see what you mean, this kind of disgust. <laughs> Whereas when I look at this, I see sadness, but I don't see disgust I see something tender hmm. mm, so between looking at himself and looking at Celia Boyd there's a switch so even though you know the painting the quality of the painting is remarkably similar you yeah. know his practice obviously um, developed over time but he did you know, he did stay with this very visceral application of paint for a long period, really right up until his death, where he became very, I guess, haphazard with the application of paint. This has got the same meatiness to the flesh as we might see in the painting from really 20 years before. But in terms of a crisis, I wonder how much of this painting is imbued with the presence of Celia. I mean, this painting is imbued, is it imbued at all with the relationship between Freud and those children, his children? Do we know that they're his children? I would assume so, I don't know actually. I know, yeah. Um, and this one, I mean, Celia Boyd, um, Celia Paul, not Celia Boyd, had a son with Freud. She met him when she was at the Slade. She just started, she was 18 and he was 55. Um, talk, about, talk about an identity crisis. Well, and this is why we come to this. Really, the Hockney was a bit of a red herring just to kind of warm us up a bit because that's so simple by comparison on many levels compared to this group of work. Yeah. So I put these in a chronological order. Hang on. This one, this one's the same person, but this is Celia Paul's painting of herself. Yeah, obviously 40 years later, 30 mm -hmm. years later. Now, I wonder, was she a happy muse? And there's lots in this. She's written a book, a um, couple of books about her, sometimes about her relationship with Freud, other times about her relationship to painting, which is vital to her. Um, she's living and working still now in London. Uh, apparently her apartment windows overlook, uh, I think it's the Royal Academy. Um, can you be your own muse? Yes. Yes. Is, uh, that, I, is that usually a happy relationship or not, do we think? Um, I think that it's, it works for people who are either um, in love with themselves or hate themselves mm. i don't think it works for people who have a healthy sense of themselves we live in a culture where people are making selfies all the time yeah why are we putting ourselves in the frames of our lives when we're already there because we're trying to impress other people is that why are we just trying absolutely 100 percent. no one would take that stuff if no one was looking at it 
That didn't happen until social media happened. But why then has anyone ever made a self-portrait? I think some people, I mean, I think people want to create a record of themselves. I mean, you know, Rembrandt made like two dozen portraits of himself or something over his life, right? Many. Um, and I mean, I think for some painters, it's that I need a subject and I'm here, you know? Fine. Sometimes it's that simple. Um, I don't think it's that simple with Freud. Or maybe it is, and this is more complicated. Well, I, I, it's funny. I would think that the self-portrait is far more complicated in his mind than this painting of Celia. I mean, we could assume things about Freud because of his uh, <laughs> prolific... Um, his prolific nature as a kind of lover, a bedder of young women, somebody who, Dalliances. who, you know, wandered around Soho and the streets of London and had tens, maybe into double digits of children with all sorts of different people. He had very, very intense relationships with his models. There's lots of, even Kate Moss now kind of coming forward and saying things about, you know, was she actually in a relationship with Freud? I mean, she sat for him. The description of his painting, you know, how close he would get to the model. Um, I mean, other people so, had- So wait, do you, see, do you see him as a creeper then? Yes, I do. Um, if but he was around now, he'd be canceled and- all that stuff. Well, I think it's really interesting that we we rush to cancel anyone, but uh, I agree. Fact, but I'm just wondering if the, the fact is, that is that yes, I'm surprised that there's not you know there's not a whole legion of people lining up to cancel Freud. Yeah, there's something that doesn't quite sit or ring true well, about how that hasn't sort of happened yet. You know, well, I think that there's also something, you know, uh, uh, assuming for the moment that he did not in any way force himself on anyone, there's also something very seductive about being around some famous artist who probably has money and well, wants to course. paint you and all the rest of it. Of so, course. Uh, but that also, you know, I'm not saying that at 18, one can't make one's own decisions about who one has sex with, for example. Yeah. But um, there is a predatory nature. And I know that I could read into this a lot based on what I know more anecdotally about Freud, his life, his lovers, and also indeed what Celia Paul has said about him herself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they did have a really extraordinary love affair, but then he did have extraordinary love affairs. With lots of people. With lots of people. Um, but that's not to discount or diminish the relationships he had with his, what I think of as like his true muses. You know, he, he might have had um, issues around kind of control and uh, issues related just to women, how he perceived them, treated them. But... Identity crisis, you know, is Freud's life in painting just one giant identity crisis? And then when we encounter the, the looking at another, as we do in this, and in, you know, his first wife, Kitty, you know, the paintings of her are, are utterly, like, devastating. These, uh, I mean, I could just read the stories into them, the devastation of being controlled, being subsumed, being coerced, being powerless in a relationship with a very, very dynamic, forceful, mysterious, beautiful, smart, disturbed man, maybe. Right. 
It's interesting though that you you say coerced and powerless. If they were powerless, they wouldn't need to be coerced. No, I mean that's why I said already. You know, at eighteen, you can make your own decisions. Yeah. But there's a very fine line between the crisis of uh, maybe vanity that makes some people, dare I say, many young women very vulnerable. Sure. And the identity crisis that is like the the underpinning element of the predatory male. I, I think that his reality, he would be far more subsumed by his own questions of self and that the women were just uh, expressions of uh confusion they were expressions of uh uh you know a, a desire to be uh um to forget to stop thinking about his own brain i think mm -hmm. i think i think that the way that he saw these women is that it was something that he wanted and he made them want him. And that that was some sort of way for him to create his own identity. I mean, when you look at this painting, Bill, are you yeah. looking at a young woman who is in repose and calm without any distress? Or do you see something of her vulnerability distress um why do you assume she's vulnerable well i'm asking what you see what you see not what i see what you see i see someone who is in a painting which means she probably stayed there for long enough for him to paint her mm -hmm. which means she wasn't running for the door and at this age he was an older, very successful man that was probably very attractive. I don't, I don't know. I, 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 tend to, I tend to come down on the side with these kinds of things that, you know, there, there's stuff in it for both sides in a weird way. But and, and, and I, think, I think the reality is somewhere real deep in the middle. But I, but I, what I guess what I'm saying is that even his, even just the idea of all of these women, I don't think he was thinking about them as individuals. It's I'm wondering if we can see, I'm wondering if we can see that it's not enough to say, see the relationship to self in self portraits. But for example, sure. along a line of thinking, when I was putting this together, I was thinking like, here's Hockney last yep. year, making a self portrait, as I said already, national treasure, kind of beloved, jolly, jolly, nice colors, you know, sure. maybe quite surface, not dark. I think that's manifested here. Yes. I just don't, I don't see, I mean, this is weird and grotesque, but I see it as a very sad person, not a dark person. Does that make sense? Right. And then when we move that artist into the looking at another human being, though, whether it's, we're seeing the darkness or the sadness, but nonetheless, some kind yeah. perhaps of crisis, she, identity she, crisis, do we then see it being? I see just, I see distraction is what I see with this. I see utter misery when I look at this. Now, In her or him? Well, I don't know. And actually, I can read what Celia Paul says about the experience of being his model and muse. Well, you have and a slight advantage then because you have the I horses do. I have, to, I have to take myself away okay. from that and I have to try and pair it back. What, what, what does she say? Well, I'll have to paraphrase. I didn't I haven't written things down as I normally would have about this because I, I actually, I mean, Celia Paul's writing is something that I enjoy and my point is is that Celia Paul met Freud when she was a very young student at the Slade and he 
persisted in her life. And he actually asked her, she's a very fine painter. Mm -hmm. He asked her to stop painting in order really to become his full-time model. Okay. Uh, and she said no. And there is something, again, I'm just taking a, a, a ballpark of this, but she did say something in an interview, I think, along the lines of, you know, the reason why she said no was not because she didn't want to actually, but I mean, paint, painting being so important to her, but yeah. also she had a suspicion that he had asked the same thing of another woman sort of 20 years before in a very similar position to her and that yeah. other woman had gone on to have three or four children with Freud and had given up painting and Celia Paul did not want that for herself she wanted okay. to be a painter and the other thing that he did apparently is he, he he made some comparison between her role and the role of Gwen John um, who was Rodin's muse mm -hmm. Uh, but that there was a very different sensibility to what Rodin did in looking at women, which was that he understood women, celebrated women, loved women. Whereas I think the, the implication is that Freud actually perhaps hated women. And you get that from the paintings or things other people say? Why do you say that? All of it. It's very difficult for me to separate it out now because having read widely about Freud there's I mean there's lots of literature about Freud there's actually you know, as I said Celia Paul herself has written uh, at least two books that I know of um, I find it fascinating how the crisis of a painter spills out into trying to control through painting both the image but also the lives of what the image symbolizes. Well, sure. I mean, I again, I think that goes back to my feeling that I don't think he sees any of these women as individuals. They're they're because he's in his own head. Um, well, I mean, I mentioned Gwen John. Mm -hmm. um, Celia Paul. Celia Paul actually has written a book which is. Um, letters to Gwen John I think she really felt connected to her through the tunnel of time uh, because yeah. of very similar perhaps predicaments uh, but, but Gwen John she was a, an amazing person um, rather overshadowed by Augustus her brother Augustus John the painter but you know she went off to France she intended to walk to Rome <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on a walking tour um with a, just a, another female friend uh, anyway she eventually wound up in paris and she met rodin and uh the rest is history but again a very fine painter who paints in such a way that you know is this a plaintive painting they look at me, look at, look at I, explore, explore who I am through my eyes. Explore who I am through my eyes. Does Freud want us to know him? Hockney's quite happy for us to know him. Do you, but do you think that, that, that could Freud have been painting that painting not so other people know him so that he could f try to know himself? Maybe. Do people, uh, 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 you know, optimize themselves in self-portraits? Sure. You know, oftentimes. Or sometimes they, you know, I don't think that, that painting of the self-portrait of Freud is particularly flattering of him. No. I, I, do we know what Gwen John looked like? Do we have photographs of her? Yes, you can. Other than the self-portraits? Yeah, you can see. Does she look like this, or is this an a, a, a idealized version of her? No, I think, I think, you know, there's a sense of um, accuracy. I mean, she, she actually, on her um, rather bold <laughs> it's, uh, ex expedition 
to Rome, which didn't she didn't reach Rome. She only got as far as Toulouse or somewhere. But she earned money along the way by doing sketches, portrait sketches. She was very good. Yeah. Capturing no, I'm not doubting that she was able to do it. I'm just wondering no, no. when, I mean, when painting herself. Capturing, in terms of capturing a likeness, she was very good. But um, Rodin asked her to give up, to give up her art. Yes, and did she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but again, there's a, a story. Why would anyone ever ask that of someone? Well, is that the identity crisis? You know, so you're, uh, no, you're no longer competition with me or something. What is what you know? I don't know, but I mean, coming back to Celia Paul, painter and model. You know, I, why should one be different to the other? Why should one be separate to the other? Can one not be both painter and model? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is this is actually, in many ways, a plaintive painting. Uh, by the way, Celia Paul, maybe this shouldn't matter, but, you know, she's a very beautiful woman. Yeah. Uh, very diverting, I would imagine. Well, I'd imagine that's why both of these, I mean, both of these women are beautiful, which is why those artists wanted them to be models for them full time. Hmm. I mean, that goes back to the Wyeth paintings and all the rest of it that we've discussed. But this is really where I want us to get to. Okay. So. This painting has got so much in it. I mean, Celia Paul paints people that she loves mainly. And over the course of her career, the people she's painted the most have been her sisters um, and especially her mother. And actually she has one sister she started painting more of more recently because her mum became incapacitated, her late mother. Couldn't get up the stairs to the flat that overlooks the Royal Academy um, to be painted. But this painting is Lucy and me. What do we see in it? Do we see a woman in crisis? Do we see a man in crisis? Do we know the man is in crisis? Is his identity somehow smeared or besmirched by her talent? Is her identity subsumed by his because of his status? Are we looking at a woman who is vulnerable? I think the fact, to me, that sort of swoosh and wash of the brush that blends them speaks so much about how she was perhaps subsumed or there was an attempt to subsume her into his desire. And here she is bare chested. There's such, I think, in terms of looking at oneself to make a self portrait, which I class this as, <laughs> there's something so oh, vulnerable, tender, in the painting of herself, that, that bare-breasted vulnerability, the position, the hunch, the leaning in of the, of the male figure of Lucien, the arm coming down. She, she seems older and he seems young to me in this painting. Tired and vital. It feels like that's an idealized version of everything that he was in one thing. And it's interesting because it also removes more of his features than it does of her, the swipe across. It's also tiny. Look at the look at the grain of the, this has to be like two inches tall. I'm just gonna read what um, Tim Adams wrote, uh, writing The Guardian, the same year as this actually. Uh, she paints mostly herself and those she loves, her four sisters, her late mother, her husband, her son. Her son, by the way, is her only child and Lucien is the father. Um, each of these singular figures emerge in her work as if from a private netherworld of thoughtful and anxious attention. Thoughtful and anxious attention. Is it also interesting, though, that in a lot of ways, it feels like she is defining, or at least the, the, the way you're presenting it, just because this is what we're talking about, mm. um, that, that 
she is in some ways defining herself by her relationship with this man and painting her with him. Are there any paintings of his with the two of them in it? Mm. That we know of? I can't think of any. I mean, so I'm wondering if like in some weird way, as much as she's discusses it and talks about it as if he was trying to subsume her being into his identity mm. in the end, his identity is far bigger part of her identity. You know, he is a bigger part of her identity than she is in his identity. He's doing, you know, even this painter and model. She's saying, even in this, like my identity is as a model for this other person. Or the identity is mine alone to choose. Maybe, and she, but she chooses to be. Do you think that there is a, in some ways, a subservient nature to a model and an artist? Is there, is there an equality relationship there, or is there a power differential between the artist and the model? I'm trying to think of a really good example where the model has had more power than the artist. Yeah. Other than the modern day of like supermodels or whatever who make a lot of money, but like normal models in painting and stuff. I don't know. I think the artist wields. Yeah. And so it is this, I don't know. I find it's like this, there's this interesting. I don't know. Happy. Disturbing. Happy. Yeah, but you know what? Hockney's weird too. Well, I mean, they are, they're con contemporaries of each other, you know, they know each other. And Bacon yeah, as yeah. well, you know, Bacon and Freud. Uh, the, these, are, these are kind of titans of um, 20th century art. Sure. Uh, in the UK, certainly. I was going to say British art. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think we've chosen the wrong ones. The wrong painters, the wrong artists. Why? Why? I mean, I'm not going to make this into a kind of feminist diatribe now, but. Well, certainly why there's is, a whole lot of mid-century, you know. Why is Gwen John? Why is Gwen John not? more celebrated well it was you know rodan took her yeah. why but, is paul not more celebrated because everything she might be in the consciousness of the public is being freud's muse yeah these are artists with their own identities yeah. They don't need the identity crises of these egocentric titans. But both of them chose to be around this person. Nothing made yes, them be around yes, that exactly. person. So, the like, choice. The element. It's, of it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because, like, if, the, if you give people agency, if you, if you assume agency in people, especially in, you know, the Western world in the 20th century, you know, no one had a gun to either of these people's heads with these painters. Mm -hmm. You know, the other woman, she gave it up. Why'd she give it up? I don't know. I'd have to read a biography. Was it because, you know what, I can at least attach myself to this guy who makes a lot of money and me being a painter is going to be hard because it's hard being a woman painter in the early 20th century. I don't know. Maybe she really didn't like painting that much. Maybe she actually didn't think she was any good. Maybe she was going to get a bunch of money from her parents and she didn't have to paint anywhere. She could paint, you know, at night before or whatever. It's, I, you know, it's like, there's so many things in there that I don't know. We have, it's like, I, 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 I buck on assuming nefarious stuff going on, you know, because we just don't know. It does, however, interest me that Celia Paul has written, written books on this and talked about it that much 
if she really didn't want to, like, if she wanted to separate herself from him, she could very well do that and just never discuss it. But she, in some ways, trades on it, right? No. Yes, in one way, but let's not forget, she isn't cancelling her past. Yeah. She isn't cancelling it. She has a son with Freud. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They remained, by the way, they remained close until his death. She does not, you know, she's not pretending to um, loathe him or... No, but I, I guess what I'm saying is I think if you read a Freud autobiography, he wouldn't talk about the women in his life nearly as much as he talked about himself. <laughs> well, The Man in the Blue Scarf, which I would recommend, by the way. Which is ironically like the real question of identity, right? I mean, I think the more the more you talk about other people rather than yourself says a lot about how much you know yourself. So the more you talk about yourself, mean, the less you know yourself. Does this mean that actually the people who are, who are in the thrall or the throes rather of identity crisis is much more likely to be Celia Paul? Yeah, probably. But you can't get in anybody's head, so you never know. Hmm. Now I'm going to go have to read up on these people's Wikipedia pages. Well, have fun with that, Bill. <laughs> Sandy hates Wikipedia. I do like a good book, however. And I would say I that uh, I do recommend Man with a Blue Scarf, which is about Freud, mm -hmm. and Celia Paul's uh, letters to Gwen John. Okay. They're very good. Anyway. Celia Paul, if you ever see this, I think your painting is beautiful. <laughs> Where does she live now? London. How old is she? Mm, in her 60s, I think. You should give her a call. Hello, Celia Paul. Yeah, why not? Why not? Anyway, Bill. I'm Sandy Robinson. You should come <laughs> on my show. Bye, Bill. Bye, Sandy. <laughs>